Okay, so uh, hello everyone. Um, my name is Niho Shah. I actually work here in Boulder um, at a sort of Haskell legal automation startup within a law firm. Um, yeah, so we do some cool stuff. We're actually hiring Haskell developers. So if you want to learn anything about what we do, um, please either contact me or Robert back there and we can tell you how it is. Uh, so yeah, my talk is on environmental dependencies as co-effects. So I thought um, it would be best to start with some motivating examples. So suppose we have um, computations that require a, that are processing a stream and it requires a fixed number of previous values. So suppose you have um, you're calculating some moving average and the, the nature of the computation is that you all require five past values in the stream. Or if you need to calculate a beat and you have a stream of sound samples and you need to complete the computation 30 past sound samples. Or suppose you're making like a uh, graphics editor application and you have like some cursor movement to draw lines and to get the smoothing right you need at least 12 data points. So just for example, suppose we have a stream of just three cursor points, and then we have the smooth function that requires these 12 previous values to compute. And then when you call smooth stream, you'll get some runtime error or maybe some unexpected behavior um, that you want to avoid. And so we really want to enforce at the type level that this function requires 12 previous values. And so we want to get a type error that stops us from writing this. So that's sort of the code we have here, where we have like a cache var, which is sort of a fixed vector, basically a new type around a fixed vector, that has um, three, this should actually be two, has two previous values and a current value. And then the smooth function has 12, this should be 13, it uses 12 previous values, and when you do the smooth, you'll get a type error that says 12 does not equal 3. So keep that sort of motivating example in the background. And let's talk about what co-effects the word actually means. So it's sort of a meaningless term because, um, you know, co, you put it in front of something and it, you just dualize the arrows. But that assumes that you have some definition of effects in terms of morphisms in a category. But effects aren't really a mathematical definition. It's something informal that, about computation that we want to capture. And Haskell captures this by modeling, modeling it using monads. So sort of an informal definition of what an effect is, is consequences of a computation on the environment besides just the output of the computation. Um, and the way this is sometimes thought of is there's some structure to your output, there's some environment to your output. In Haskell, it's modeled using monads. Coefix, on the other hand, are dependencies of the computation on the environment. So instead of um, having an environment on your in output, you have an environment on your input. It's a structured input. And it can be modeled using indexed co-monads. Now, there's no real reason for this asymmetry between monads and index co-monads, um, because you can, in fact, model effects using index monads, and you get actually a lot more precise type guarantees for uh, your monadic computations. But that's not what this talk is really about. OK, so before I get deeper into what a co-effect is, I'd like to talk about some of the formalities. So um, most of the work that's been done in COFX is um, done by a few grad students and a professor at, he's at Kent now, but he was at Cambridge, Thomas Petrick and Danny Orchard. And there are a few papers written on it. And basically, it's like a PL uh, theory paper, and they develop a co-effect calculus and a um, categorical semantics for that calculus. And what I did was try to attempt to give, uh, try to implement it in Haskell and see how far it could get. And actually, there are some limitations to the type system in Haskell that um, not all the examples they have in their paper can actually be expressed. 
Um, so the coming in GitHub is uh, this GitHub slash NeilOS Coeffect Extras, and the slides are here at this URL. So um, if, as you remember from the example, I have to use a value, um, a natural number like 12 and 3, to actually in my type. And so I use a lot of dependently typed features in Haskell, and that comes with sort of a litany of uh, language extensions. And so these are all the language extensions I turn on in GHC. Uh, so if anybody has any questions or see some weirdness um, about those language extensions, please let me know and I can clear up anything. Cool. So if you really think about what uh, functional languages are famous for, it's referential transparency. And the essential idea is that we live in this category of pure functions. And we have this notion of apply where if we have a function that goes from a value A to a value B, and we have a value A, and as, lo as long as that function terminates, we, the only consequence of the computation is on the real world is making your CPU hot to produce that B, as long as it terminates. Um, it doesn't touch the file system, it doesn't launch missiles, it doesn't throw an exception. But to model those things, we use monads in Haskell, right? And instead of applying a pure function, you bind a monadic action. And so essentially what this is, is if A produces a B, but also modifies some environment M, then if you have an environment that already has that value M, uh, has that value A in the environment, then you bind the output to get the environment with that B. Luckily, to lift pure values into the environment, you have this return. And this is essentially analogous to identity. Comonads are the dual. So instead of um, having an environment on your output, you have an environment on your input. And instead of binding a monadic action to, to, your, uh, to the value, you extend the, um, the function across your entire input. So this is normally very useful for sort of very generic traversals where you need some notion of um, some notion of neighborhood, right? To, to compute some average or compute some summary statistic or uh, do some image processing. So it's nice for elegant traversals, but it doesn't really work for type safety because you have this extract. And this extract is very leaky, right? You just sort of take out this input and then you, you leak out the context and it doesn't really give you some, some type safety. And so we not, sort of need to express more in that type and restrict the composability. And we do that by using a type level monoid. So I'm going to review monoids a little bit here. Does anybody think that's sort of a waste of time? Or Okay, well, I'll, I'll review them. <laughs> um, so typically we have this, we have this type class um, in Haskell called a monoid, and it's basically you have some type that has a notion of like an empty value, and you have a way of combining two values of that type to produce another value. So this is like everywhere. You can have a monoid over integers that's the sum, so the empty value is zero, and the append is um, summing. Um, and in each case, we want to lift it to the type, uh, type level. And so instead of having an um, empty value of a certain type, we have an empty type of a certain kind. Um, and this is the sort of notation for this. This is the lifting up this to the type level. So this is sort of the corresponding thing for the natural numbers. So there's no, it's not quite because there's no negative numbers in the values, but um, then um, we have product is another example of a monoid. So we have the empty value being one and the combination value being product. We lift it in this way. Um, and for Booleans, we have uh, the empty value being true and the append being or. There's another monoid instance where you have and and uh, false as the empty value. So you can also uh, lift, this, lift this up to the type value, uh, type level. 
So if we contrast this with um, the previous slide with the monads, what we do is when we have an index monad, we sort of have this extra phantom parameter that is used to restrict the composability. And actually, a lot of things that go on in other Haskell libraries dealing with like extensible effects or uh, parameterized monads, which are used for like pre and post conditions on IO uh, or like safe file handles, a lot of that can be captured uh, in this general characterization by choosing a specific monoid. So for example, in extensible effects, you can consider this unit to be the empty list of effects and this plus to be just uh, list concatenation of your atomic effects. And if you look at the spine, essentially, if you have, <clears throat> if you have uh, a, the type level phantom parameter has a value t and an s, then when you can actually do the bind, you get the combination of the t s and t. And also, you can recover um, quite trivially regular monoids, monads, just by uh, choosing the monoid to be the unit monoid. <clears throat> In index comonads, um, you sort of have this dual notion. So you have the unit for the, the extract, and you have the return. But with the extend, um, notice that the plus is on the input and not on the output. So when you extend it across the entire context, you sort of reduce the value by that plus. And you can only extract the value when you get to the unit. And so it's not as leaky as a regular comonad as long as you stay within the comonadic way, uh, world. So um, you define this co-effect type class that sort of wraps the comon index comonad stuff with the type level monoid stuff. So we create this co-effect type class, which has the associated type families for the monoid, uh, the unit, the plus. We have to, the W sort of allows us to specify what monoid we're using for that particular index comonad so that we get the whole co-effect. Um, and, you know, we take in an S of a certain kind and a T of a certain kind and produce another kind. That's the M append. <clears throat> and so we define our extract, just as we did in the previous slide, where we take that unit, uh, we have that phantom parameter with the unit and the A. Uh, this extend has to have this extra constraint kind because often when we're doing type level stuff, like if you in particular if we're using type level naturals, we have to have extra constraints to actually write this extend to get the value level natural. So if you've ever done sort of dependently type programming in Haskell, you have to declare if this is like a natural number n and this is natural number m, then you have to declare that, oh, I know this natural in the constraint. And so we keep around sort of a list of constraints. And that's this, we use constraint kinds to, to get this. So any questions about this? Because this is sort of, I mean, it's a co-effect talk, and it's like co-effect type class. This is like the apex of it. So, yeah? I got a comment and a question. Uh, I think you misspelled to lock the three jokes uh, name on the first line. I think there's a name. I'm going to go check that. OK. Yeah, I'll correct that. Sorry. Okay. I'm not really familiar with that. Um, I have played around with comonads mostly for these traversals, and this is the first time where I've seen like comonads used to enforce some sort of type level invariance. So, but do you do you want to comment a little bit more on? Uh, yeah, I think Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. I think I've seen a talk like this where it's sort of like um, the DOM is 
considered some sort of co-monadic structure. Which... Did you have a question? So the <clears throat> the inclusion of the the in constraint kind at this level seems so. I believe that it's sort of motivated by the instances that you're going to write in this class, mm -hmm. but it seems kind of out of place in in terms of uh, like, like, can you explain the purpose of that constraint in the absence of defining any instances where like you would need a specific set of constraints? Because ordinarily with that sort of thing, I like to have the constraints actually on um, on the use site rather than the declaration site, as it were. Oh, I see. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess um, the use here is for the, the defining a generic extend. It's sort of implied that you'll need to use these. Um, you need to use the value level interpretation of the type level con of the the type level phantom parameters that monoid to actually you know restrict the composability or get the right composition that you want that that's sort of the best approximation I could get to right. it yeah. no, that makes sense. Um, so let's go back to that cast bar example so um we have this uh, it's called data flow, another way of saying it. So our type level monoid is, we, we define this new type cache var, which has this phantom parameter, or it has this parameter, it's not really phantom, this pr type level parameter n, right? And we have, um, this doesn't act, this can be phantom, I just wanted to make sure I had some type safety around my, um, my actual implementation. But it's just a new type around vector. And essentially, notice there's an n plus 1. And the way we sort of interpret this is the cache var has n previous values, and we have plus 1 as the, the current value. And then the unit uh, here is just 0, and the plus is n plus 1, m. So it's just the sum monoid. Um, and then the extract is pretty simple. We want to, once we get to zero previous values, so we just have this become a vector of one length, then we can just get the last element of that vector. And that's the current value. The extend is um, interesting. So we um, notice we have this, this value, this function that basically consumes m values to produce an a, and then we apply it to this vector that has m plus m previous values. And then we, by, by extending it, we're consuming m of those values, and so we have to produce a cache var of n values. And so the way you sort of do this is using a duplicate function, and since this f map, you sort of create all the different m uh, subwindows of that n list to get it. And then to actually extract the sort of the previous uh, vector values, you have this helper function previous that will just take the init of it. OK, so um, that was the cast var example of a, a um, co-effect. But then uh, I'll try to talk about um, a bounded reuse example. So suppose we have some resource uh, external to the pure computation, external to our computer, that is limited by the number of times we can use it. So in particular, suppose we have like six MRI machines, and if we use more than that, or we don't even have as many as that, if we use more than that, you know, there'll be too much radiation in the room, and that will cause bad things to happen. Or suppose there's like we have a real life cute uh, quantum computer and we're building up this quantum computation that we're going to send, but because of quantum technology, we only have 15 qubits available. Or we're programming some microcontroller and we have this type safety around developing an assembly program that can only have access to two registers. <clears throat> we want to basically, at the type level, 
restrict you from having writing code that uses more than this many resources, a fixed number of resources. So the way I tried to go about this, and this actually, there are limitations to the current implementation of Haskell that you can't do actually this in the current GSC version. But I'll, I'll go over how I tried to do it. So I, I defined this new type bound var, and it has also a type level parameter n, but no plus one. And it basically, the way I sort of thought of this is we'd keep creating copies of the same value, and as we like reuse them, we would, when the duplicate function, we would sort of create more and more copies that we'd append to each, uh, apply to each of the um, functions that we put into extend. And so the, the, co the type level monoid in the co-effect here is the unit is uh, one, and we just use the product uh, monoid. And so <clears throat> when we've consumed sort of, um, we've used all the values and we're left with one, we can extract the final value of the computation. And that would just be one of the copies. So that'd be the, the head of the list. <coughs> and then we define this extend function, which basically says like, if you, if you have this function that consumes, um, uses a variable uh, of type A, M times, to produce a B, then to produce N Bs, you need um, N times M values uh, of A. Sort of makes sense? Right. But wouldn't it just be N plus N? Because you only are using N, right? N values. So it takes, it's sort of like if you need, um, f uh, if you need like, if it takes three apple, if you use an apple three, or use a value three times to produce one B, mm -hmm. then to produce um, sure. six, yeah. you need two, three times two values of A, right? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So the way this duplicate function works is essentially you have, um, you know, N times M copies of the same value, and then you sort of chunk each of those copies to get M, um, to get, uh, uh, you know, N copies of um, M copies. And then we, we have this helpful function bound, which basically takes a value and does the replication. But this doesn't actually work. And it doesn't make any much sense because there's no notion of a copy of a pure value in Haskell. Because a pure value, you just sort of produce it, and you can use it as many times as you want when you write your functions. Um, so if we were to actually like implement a function that like tries to triple the copies, I would have to enforce that the that I only use these names, even though they're the same copy of the value. I only use these names, but I've used x twice here. So this doesn't actually work, and the reason for this is we don't actually have linear types in Haskell. Linear types is, do I need to go over linear types? For the, yes. Well, okay. So linear types basically say, um, so notice that the, I can use x as many times as I, as I want, or I, can use, I don't have to use it at all. Linear types enforce, say that Essentially, this arrow, this arrow with a dot, often called the lollipop arrow, says that I can only use this value once at, to produce one of this value. And you have to use it once. You can't use it zero times, and you can't use it more than one time. And so the bounded reuse really can only be can't be ex the extend and extract laws can't be expressed with just the ordinary Haskell arrow. It needs the linear function arrow, the lollipop operator. So um, this is a bit experimental. I tried to uh, use, so there's this branch of GHC um, created by Tweak that's trying to implement linear types in Haskell. And I tried to get it this actual actually to work with 
some modifications to the actual type to use the lollipop. So the extract with the lollipop, um, the, um, the extend with the lollipop, um, but notice this is not a lollipop right here. Um, and the bound function actually, if you really think about it, if you're enforcing that this is just producing one value that you can consume later, you can only use this once, but to actually replicate it, you have to use it, you know, n many times. So you have to do this unsafe to linear function that will actually do the copies, but that's only in the implementation. Um, if you don't, you know, change that implementation, the using everything else around it is, is safe. Um, this actually doesn't work um, quite in, uh, in linear Haskell because they haven't in that branch implemented constraint kinds. And um, a lot of the, like, the size vector library has to like, be ported over to use the same function implementations, but to use the lollipop operator to work correctly. So that's a little complicated. Um, so I actually have a rudimentary implementation in the GitHub. Um, you have to use the lit linear branch, sorry, the linear branch of that GitHub, and you can view the actual code. It's a little more pared down because they don't have constraint kinds and they don't have. But theoretically, in the future, if linear types are implemented in Haskell. This would, ha this would be how it worked. But this also doesn't work for the original problem I said because there isn't any. This is only a bound on pure var variables, not on monadic actions. So even if I had uh, linear Haskell, once I extracted the IO action, this is a representation of the action as a value. It's not the running of the action itself. And so once I've extracted it, I can use act as many as I want. And if it's a nefarious thing like launching missiles, I can use it as, as often as I want. So the way to get around this is actually to use index monads and index comonads in tandem. And you create this distributive law where essentially as you're, as you're composing this by Kleisley arrow, this by effect, um, you're, cons you're running the actual IO action. And then when you get to the end, when you actually extract it, the IO that extracts it back, this is false. This, this, um, the monoid is a Boolean here. It's a live, um, it's a Boolean over, um, it's a monoid uh, with a type level Boolean. It's actually when you distribute it, when this, once this becomes M, this becomes false and it doesn't actually return anything. It's ran, ran everything, uh, ran, and this is, this is um, called grading, um, and you actually need by Kleisley composition instead of just co Kleisley and Kleisley composition. So as you can see, there's sort of a lot of problems with um, the what you can express in Haskell types now. Uh, and so there's this research language developed by Daniel Orchard called a granule and it, it's sort of very similar to Idris that it has dependent types, but it also has um, this bounded linear types, uh, bounded reuse types. So if you look at this type signature, it's very similar to Haskell where you declare that you're only going to take values that can be used twice. And if you look at the map function, you're saying, okay, I have a vector of type n and I want to produce a vector of type n b and that's, you can define the map pretty easily but you're saying that I'm gonna use this function n times. So this, this, this notation is basically saying how many times you're using the function in the, in, the, in, in the higher order function. So this is the link to it and it's pretty cool um, stuff to play around with. Uh, so some of the things you still can do um, in, in Haskell, besides just data flow, is implicit parameters. Now, there is an implicit parameters extension in Haskell, so this is a little more tedious notation, but I think it's kind of cool that all of these sort of fall under the same abstraction of co effect. But essentially, a co reader, um, implicit parameters can be thought of as a co reader. You have this new type around the value of the computation that involve, that needs the implicit parameters. And then you have 
a set of mappings between variable names and the, uh, the actual value of that variable. And so the type level unit here is the, the empty map, and the plus is just union of these different maps. So extracting, you can only extract once you've sort of set all those um, implicit parameters. And extend um, this sort of notion where you um, <coughs> where you have the the plus being the the union, um, and then you have this helper function ask, which will, uh, given a variable name, will give you the actual value that that variable is mapped to. What? Where? Top line. Top line. Yeah. And the definition of the theoretical parameter IS. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so um, there are a lot of other uses um, for these co-effects uh, that you can think of. And the game here is really trying to choose the right type level of monoid. So you can think of um, API versions. And so assuming like backwards compatibility, you only want to compose with functions that are of either the same value or greater. Um, and so the monoid here, if you have semantic versioning where you have a major minor version, um, the, the monoid here is the, the max function in the, the lexicographic order uh, on these type level naturals. And type classes can also be seen as implicit parameters. That's actually what type classes do sugar to. But the, uh, the implicit parameter is basically a record type. So if you think of show, you can think of it as a record type that has um, just a function from A to string, a rank N record type. Uh, you can also do things like liveness analysis, where you have um, Boolean with um, the, the, the monoid operation being AND. So yeah, um, some further directions. Um, something that's discussed in the paper is the difference between structural and flat co-effects. So there's actually this asymmetry in lambda calculus where lambda calculus takes in multiple inputs to produce one output. And so you can have this type level monoid on each variable or on the entire context of all the variables. And I was using just flat co-effects but suppose you have two bounded variables, there might be some interaction between that, each of those annotations, and you might have a different composition law. And so I think you could probably implement structural co-effects using an arrow interface. And doing that kind of grading with the by Kleisley arrow can also be done pretty nicely in an arrow interface. So I've been toying around with building this by, by effect arrows library. Um, yeah, so that's the, and obviously, I, I think I talked earlier about distributing index monads and co-monads. So, um, yeah, um, thank you for your time. And do you guys have any questions? Probably finished pretty early, maybe? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, if I can just put in a free plug for the Lambda conference front desk, they have lots of copies of the book of Monad, and one of the chapters in there is on effects, and it's a very accessible discussion. Mm -hmm. So people that are enthusiastic after seeing the presentation might want to take a look at that. So I've, I've seen a few presentations on, on come on events, but something I haven't seen before um, or, or well discussed is, okay, given this Comanite interface, what does code written with a Comanite constraint uh, look like in, in you know, sort of common use? And you know, my, my interest is specifically with respect to the you know, replacing type classes or replacing uh, a, you know, a set of effects um, as, as an implicit parameter. But do you have, you know, or can you show some code that's that's kind of that's kind of written consuming, uh, or, or with the, with these constraints? Um, yeah, so it tends to be pretty 
pretty narrowly, in particular with like implicit parameters, because of how um, I think it's just the way dependently typed Haskell is. It's sort of clunky, uh, and so I mean, if you want to look at like actually dealing with these type level sets, um, this is sort of uh, yes, you can see that. Yeah, this is sort of what the the mapping looks like. And there is some type reference, type reference here. So, like, if you actually, you notice um, he um, commented out this type level map, uh, and it, it can actually infer that, you know, taking composing the union of foo and bar will give you this. And so, this is how you actually construct the implicit parameters. And, you know, that's it's quite a lot to put in your type signature, and can be sort of. Um, but then you have to have sort of a constraint that says that, like, you know, this is a union with these mappings. And so that's even more work you need to. If you guys are curious about the index monads, um, have the effects monad library is actually um, where you can find the, the index monad example. Yeah. Right. So this, yeah, this probably can be avoided by using like a yeah, parallel numbers. You build them yourself, probably. Okay. So probably have, I, I yeah, but probably I mean, I guess the here is that like you kind of want it to be general without, you know, without type level monoids that use natural numbers as their as their their monoid, right? You want it to be generic across that. But, but in general, this is sort of Yeah, yeah. No, what I would really want to do is maybe see how this works in a language like Idris. Um, Yeah, I wonder if there's, do you actually have to put the constraints? I think you would need those constraints if those constraints are required for the actual expressing of the composition law, right? Yeah, so I, I, what it looks like to me is that um, with those, those type numbers. Uh, and we should go back to the type class. Oops. Oh, going too fast. Okay, cool. There. Any other questions? Um, maybe some of the... I mean, there's some nice sort of abstract nonsense around this too. So you can actually think of these index monads or comonads as functors from a particular category to the category of comonads or monads on Hask. Um, it's actually strict monoidal, I think, functor. So, a precise term. Um, um. Okay, cool. Well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs>